Good morning. Good morning. We welcome everyone today. Uh, our privilege to be here on Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. Uh, we are reflecting upon the Supreme Court decision in 1973, January 22nd, that uh, uh, made abortion legal through the nine months of pregnancy. And we're going to talk about why we ought to care about the unborn. Uh, today we also have a bi-monthly offering for National Lutherans for Life. If you're, if you're moved in your heart to give toward it, it's one of the baskets or back there. Uh, also, typically at this time, we hand out the uh, little baby bottles to raise for uh, Men Pregnancy Resource Center. We're not going to do the little bottles this year, so we have one big baby bottle. That's also right over there. So if you feel like contributing for the men, uh, you may put your checks or cash in that big baby bottle back there. So we're thankful for that opportunity as well. Uh, there was a chance I was exposed to COVID this last week, so I got tested on Friday and I came out negative, praise God. So I'm good to go and uh, so I'm happy to be here with you also today. Let's rise and uh, greet one another from afar and then we'll begin with our first hymn. our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Lord, we are so thankful to you for giving us life and health, but sometimes we take these for granted. Lord, we forget that you have called us to care for the health and welfare of other people. In our busyness, we forget to pray for and help those who are struggling with physical difficulties. Lord, there are vulnerable people in our world, little children who cannot speak for themselves, and adults who are too old to defend themselves. Forgive us for not caring for them. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess to you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. The angel said to Joseph, that Mary will give birth to a child and you will call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins, which he did when he died for our sins and rose from the dead. And so by God's command and in his place, I announce your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us all with gladsome voice Please be seated. Our Old Testament lesson this morning is from the 139th Psalm, and we'll, we'll read responsibly. O oh Lord, you have searched me, and you know me. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. You hem me in, behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. My frame was not hidden from you when I made when I was made in the secret place. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle lesson is from the first chapter of 1 Timothy, beginning with the ninth verse. 
We also know that law is made not for the righteous, but for the lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for adulterers and perverts, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which he entrusted to me. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. This is the word of the Lord. We rise for the reading of the Gospel lesson, which comes to us from Luke chapter 1. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. We confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed and its explanation. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe that God has made me and all creatures, that he has given me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my reason and all my senses, and still takes care of them. He also gives me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, wife and children, land, animals, and all I have. He richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and life. He defends me against all danger and guards and protects me from all evil. And all this purely out of fatherly divine goodness and mercy, without any merit or worthiness in me. For all this it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. You may be seated.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. What matters the most to you? You might answer, I myself matter to myself. And that's okay in the sense that we are all stewards of our bodies and our lives, so we should take care of ourselves. But apart from ourselves, who or what makes the most or has the most value to you? I would probably say for myself, it would be obviously God first, family, then church, then our country, and, and then the world. But look at it from another point of view. What matters the most to me is life. Most important of all, eternal life, that is our gift through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I highly regard those who spread the gospel, pastors and missionaries and everyday Christians who bring the gospel to people that gives them eternal life. But apart from eternal life, I also value human life. And so I think a lot about people like doctors and nurses and EMTs, those who defend life or save life. But as you think about it, you could also say, well, I also highly regard farmers and truckers and grocers who preserve life from day to day by giving us food and a lot of other occupations as well that have to do with preserving our lives. Can we be saving lives like doctors and nurses? Well, when it comes to the unborn, the answer is yes, we can have a great influence in our world. And today I want to talk about, well, why should we care about the unborn? And I'd like to give you five reasons, and it might be helpful if you take out the outline in the bulletin today and follow along. The first reason we should care is because of Scripture. As Christians, we believe that the Bible is the Word of God. God spoke through the prophets of the Old Testament, the apostles of the New Testament, to give us the exact things he wanted to tell us. And everything that God gives us in the Bible is a good thing for our blessing. And it's clear as one reads the Bible that God values all human life from the time of conception until death. We can see that in today's Old Testament reading from Psalm 139, where we are told that God is the one who's creating the child in the womb. And David said, Thou didst form my inward parts, thou didst weave me in my mother's womb. So at the very least, the taking of life in the womb interrupts the work of God. We also learn from Psalm 51, verse 5, a psalm where David was confessing his sins of adultery with Bathsheba and murder of her husband. He's confessing his sins, and he says this, In sin my mother conceived me. He was talking about his own sinfulness. And he's getting to the root of his problem of sin, and he says that he was born, he was conceived actually, with this sinful nature. And a blob of tissue isn't sinful, only human beings are sinful. And then when we get to the Gospel reading for today, we had the word baby uh, used for John the Baptist in the womb. The Greek word is brephos, which is also used in Luke chapter 2 when Mary gives birth to Jesus and wraps him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. So that word is used both for the unborn child and for the child who is born. Also in our Gospel lesson for today, we read about Mary's visit to Elizabeth. As soon as Mary found out she was pregnant with the Lord Jesus, we think within days she went to see her relative Elizabeth. Elizabeth was six months pregnant with John the Baptist. And we are told that when Mary came into Elizabeth's presence, that John the Baptist, six months old in the womb, leaped for joy in the presence of Jesus and the mother of Jesus. So this little baby in the womb felt emotion. And then Elizabeth says to Mary, whose little baby Jesus is just a 
maybe days, weeks old in the womb, how is it that the mother of my Lord should come to me? She refers to that little baby just recently developing as my Lord. You and I are valuable individuals because God made us. And secondly, we are valuable to God because he redeemed us with the blood of Jesus. No matter what our sin has been in the past, Jesus died for our sins, and it applies to those who knowingly or unknowingly have taken the life of an unborn. The Bible says that Jesus redeemed us, that he purchased us to be his own by his blood and made us his own children. One of the arguments in favor of abortion is that every child should be a wanted child. It's really a sad thing, isn't it, that parents who know that when they unite with each other, there's potential for giving a conception, having a child, and then they say, well, we don't really, after all, want this child. It's a very sad thing. But even if the parents do not want the child, that does not diminish the value of that child whom God was creating in the womb. Your parents may have been Bonnie and Clyde for that matter. It doesn't cheapen your value. Psalm 27 verse 10 says, For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. The scriptures indicate that the unborn are val valuable human beings, but also God's commandments. All of the Ten Commandments serve to protect valuable things. Think about it. The Fourth Commandment, honor your father and your mother, protect families, so important to God. The Sixth Commandment, you shall not commit adultery, protects marriage. The Seventh, you shall not steal, protects our property. The Eighth, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, protects our reputations. The fifth commandment, you shall not murder, protects our bodies. These are very precious to God and are to be precious to us. You shall not murder means that God values human life and so also ought we. God alone gives life and God alone is to take life. So the first reason we should care for the unborn is because of what God says in the Holy Scriptures. Secondly, we should do so because of observation. Because of technology, we know more about the unborn child than we have ever known in history. We know that the one cell of the father unites with the one cell of the mother, and each gives 23 chromosomes gathered together into a new individual with 46 chromosomes, a living blueprint developing from the moment of conception, and from that moment of conception, everything you are today was already determined back then, what your sex would be, your blood type, your color of hair, whether or not you had freckles, or, and so forth. It's not simply that we have genetic information on a piece of paper, but this is a, a living being that has this genetic information in itself, and it only needs time, food, and oxygen to continue to grow until maturity. The baby's heart begins to beat at 21 days after conception. Brain waves can be detected around six weeks. At eight to 10 weeks, all the body systems are present. And so we might ask the question, should we take the life of a child because it is unseen? Well, can you take the life of someone in another room when you can't see them, we can say no. But actually, now we can see the unborn. It's just covered up by the mother's tummy because by technology and ultrasound, we can actually look inside and see the baby as many parents do in the weeks and months prior to their delivery. Should we kill the baby because it isn't fully developed? Well, physical maturity doesn't happen until somewhere in the 20s. It's a continuous progress of development and maturity from conception until, uh, in, say, the mid-20s or so. Should we kill a baby because it isn't born yet? 
Well, suddenly, does something happen to the baby once it's born? Now, we use the word viable to indicate at what point in the pregnancy we are able to save a child. About 100 years ago, it was only about the 32nd week. If you were uh, born before the 32nd week of pregnancy, the child would probably be lost. Now, because of the advancement in technology, it's down to about 24 weeks. So, a baby that was born at uh, 31 or 32 weeks, 100 years ago, was that a, a baby? Uh, while it was still in the womb, it wasn't a baby. Now it, it's 24 weeks, is it a baby once it's born, but it wasn't a baby moments before when it wasn't born. Now viability only tests our advancement in technology. So is a baby that's born suddenly uh, a human being? Well, uh, there, what happens when a child is born? The only thing that happens is that certain systems in the baby begin to kick in. And no longer does it eat and breathe through the placenta and the umbilical cord, but through its mouth. Uh, no longer does it eliminate waste through the placenta and the umbilical cord, now through the bottom. So different systems suddenly kick in for the child, but nothing really happens to the baby, and nothing real dramatic happens once it is born. The truth is that human life is an ongoing process and growth from the moment of conception till maturity and then a slow decline until death. And we can give names to the various stages in this continuum. So when a baby's first born, it's called a zygote, and then it's a blastocyst, and then it's a fetus. And then when it's born, we'll call it an infant, and then a little bit later, a toddler and a child, and then it becomes an adolescent. And we don't say, oh, there's an adolescent there, meaning somehow that that teenager is not human. We don't say, oh, that's a toddler. That, that's not a valuable human being. It's just one stage. But people will say, oh, it's just a fetus. But that's just one stage in that continuum. It's not meant to devaluate the child. But some will say, I don't know if it's human or not. Can't really know for sure. Well, let's suppose you're walking down an old part of town and there's an old uh, warehouse and they're about to blow it up, build something newer. And you're walking by and a construction worker says, you know, I think somebody's still inside. Well, you wouldn't pull the switch, would you? Because you value life, you put a priority on life, you would wait, send somebody in, check out, make sure there's nobody inside. Or if you're out on a hunting trip and you see something move from behind the tree and you say, I'm not sure if it's an animal or a human being, you're not going to shoot because we've put a priority on human life. We give it the benefit of the doubt. We care about the unborn, first of all, because of what Scripture teaches, and secondly, by what we observe now through technology. Thirdly, because of defenselessness. The unborn child in the womb is defenseless, just like a toddler. But the womb should be the safest place on earth. If the government will not defend the children, and if parents won't defend their own children, Who's going to defend the defenseless? Proverbs 31, verses 8 and 9 says, Open your mouth for the dumb, for the rights of the unfortunate, and defend the rights of the afflicted and needy. So many people will say this, though. I believe, personally, that taking that the unborn child is a human being, and it, it would be wrong for me to take the life of that child but I think it's a woman's right to choose. Or they'll say something similar. I wouldn't do it myself, but I, I'm not going to judge other people. Well, someone said, your right to swing your fist ends at the point of my nose. 
The reason for that is that my nose is my nose, and your hand is your hand, and I've got a separate body than yours. You want to beat yourself up? I said, I guess go ahead. But you can't beat me up. And uh, the reality is, is that the mother's body and the baby's body are two different bodies. It's a body inside of the body, a body being protected by the mother. And that's quite obvious because the mother can be woman and the baby can be a man inside of her. Years ago, I was outside of a courty, county courthouse and about halfway across the parking lot, there was a young man who was abusing a young woman verbally, maybe a little bit physically too, and I just sat there and froze, didn't do anything. And then there was a the voice of a woman on the other side of the parking lot who yelled out, ma'am, are you okay? Do you need any help? And I felt so ashamed at that moment because I hadn't done anything. What if that young man had pulled out a knife and threatened her? Would I have said to myself, well, I wouldn't kill her, but he has a right to do with his body whatever he wishes. I wouldn't kill her, but I don't want to be judgmental. I don't want to enforce my or force my moral standards upon him. Well, that doesn't make sense. Can't we agree on this, that life, life itself is valuable and must be protected by everyone, for everyone? Don't we all know this from the Ten Commandments, you shall not murder? Didn't God write his moral law on our hearts so that everyone knows instinctively that it is wrong to take the life of another person? If you say, don't cast your morality on me, then don't be surprised and don't complain if somebody kills you. You say, that's wrong, that's not my morality. They'll say, well, that's my morality, however. Martin Luther wrote in his large catechism, if you send a person away naked when you could clothe him, you have let him freeze to death. <coughs> Excuse me. If you see anyone suffer hunger and do not feed him, you have let him starve. Likewise, if you see anyone condemned to death or in a similar peril, and do not save him, although you know ways and means to do so, you have killed him. It will do you no good to plead that you did not contribute to his death by word or deed, for you have withheld your love from him and robbed him of the service by which his life might have been spared. We care for the unborn because of what Scripture teaches us, also because of what we can observe with technology and also because the children are defenseless, but also we care because of history. The history of man is littered with murder. In the Bible, we find Cain killing Abel, David killing Uriah because he wanted Uriah's wife Bathsheba and to cover her up his relationship with her that brought forth a baby. Herod killed the babies in Bethlehem because he feared that his rule as a king might be taken away from him. The victims were always perceived as getting in the way of the comfort and the happiness of the murderer. Let me give you two notable examples from history of unwanted persons. Adolf Hitler, the supreme leader of Germany in the 1930s, called the Jews a race but not human. By designating them as not human, he felt he could kill them at will, and thus millions were eliminated. Second example, Dred Scott was a black slave who served uh, a, an army surgeon. When the surgeon was transferred to a northern state, he took his slave along with him. When Dred Scott made it to one of these northern states, he sued for his freedom because it was illegal to have slaves in that state. It went before the Supreme Court. But he was designated as not being a person. 
1857, Chief Justice Roger Taney wrote, they had for more than a century been regarded as beings of an inferior order and altogether unfit to associate with the white race, either in social or political relations, and so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect and that Negro might justly and lawfully be reduced to slavery for his benefit. Now, fast forward to January 22, 1973. Justice Harry Blackman took his stand in favor of the killing of the unborn when he wrote, the unborn have never been recognized in the law as persons in the whole sense. History tends to repeat itself. Winston Churchill wrote, those that fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. William Brennan wrote, although every Holocaust ever perpetrated is an unprecedented event in its own right, this should not detract from what all Holocausts share in common. The systematic and widespread destruction of millions looked upon as indiscriminate masses of subhuman expendables. The cultural environment for a human holocaust is present whenever any society can be misled into defining individuals as less than human and therefore devoid of value and respect. We are seeing history repeating itself. We care about the unborn because of what scripture teaches us, because of observation, because the unborn are defenseless, and because of history and not wanting to repeat itself. And finally, because of duty. Our greatest duty is to proclaim the forgiveness of sins that we have in Jesus Christ. This forgiveness is not only for those who have had abortions or for those who have supported those who have had abortions, but also for those who have sat idly, idly by doing very little or nothing to protect the unborn. This is the sin of omission. God's word tells us while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. John the Baptist pointed to Jesus and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And the apostle John wrote, The blood of Jesus which was shed for us on the cross. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And then he said, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, these two last passages are very, very important. And I have a list of them in my Bible which tells us about complete forgiveness. We read these passages about how God forgives sins, but these passages that say God has forgiven all sins and all sinners are very, very comforting to us. King David, who had murdered Uriah, wrote, How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. He said, I acknowledge my sin to thee, and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and thou didst forgive the guilt of my sin. And today also, now in the Lord's Supper, we hear God tell us, in a special way that our sins have been forgiven. God says to us, given and shed for you this body and blood for the forgiveness of your sins, and as a special proof of our forgiveness, give, gives us to eat and drink his very body and blood. So it's our duty to proclaim the gospel of forgiveness, but then it's our duty to teach others about the value of the unborn. In order to teach, we must first teach ourselves, and there's some wonderful tools. My favorite one is this little book, Who Broke the Baby? And this book is basically, each chapter, a different abortion slogan, and then the author answers each slogan with scripture and facts and uh, Things like every child, a wanted child, a freedom to choose, a fetus is not a person. What about the hard cases like rape or maybe I'll have an abnormal child? And just wonderful, wonderful tool. 
Uh, these are avail available to you for free in the narthex today. Uh, also, if you're interested, there's a class we teach here at church called Making Abortion Unthinkable, which if you talk to me or to one of our elders, we're willing to have that class once again for you. You can also go online to National Right to Life and read the articles there or get their newsletter. The same thing goes for National Lutherans for Life, going online or receiving their quarterly journal called Life Day. And once you have taught yourself, you can begin to teach others. Maybe something as simple as sending them the link to this sermon or sending them a copy of today's sermon. Uh, Adolf Hitler said, he alone who owns the youth gains the future. So it's most important for parents and churches to teach the youth about the unborn child and what God expects of us. In public, we can wear the precious feet, the size of a baby's feet at the eight to ten, I think it's ten weeks, and you can see the little toes, you wear that, somebody says, what's that? You say, well, let me tell you about the unborn child, and you can give them some facts. And, and then we have the, again, a 10 to 12 week old baby, the actual size, and you can pick these up in the narthex as well. And put that in your pocket or in your purse and be willing to take that out and talk to somebody, give them the facts about the unborn. You can give them a copy of the 180 movie, marvelous 33 minute, fast-paced, very realistic, though I wouldn't give it to a little child. You can watch it online on YouTube, the 180 movie, where evangelist Ray Comfort changes people's minds within a matter of seconds. And you can get some ideas about how you could approach others by watching that video. There's also pamphlets there which have pictures of the unborn. Those are very convincing. Uh, and people no longer can say, oh, that's just a glob of tissue. I can see that baby right there. God has given us the precious gift of life. Through Jesus' death and resurrection, he's given us the gift of eternal life. And the question is, do you and I care about life? And if so, what will you and I do? Or will we simply sit idly by. Uh, God grant that we who care, care enough to teach others. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. Let us rise for prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you for giving us the gift of life. Help us to treasure the life that you have given to us with our time and effort. Help us to care for those who are sick, hurting, abused, handicapped, and for those who are simply in danger because others don't want them. Forgive us for those times when we have treated our bodies and the bodies of others with disregard. Father, we ask your blessing on organizations and individuals who work to protect life. Men and Lutherans for Life, National Right to Life, Senators, Congressmen, Governors, and judges who seek to protect life. Give safe surgery tomorrow to Linda Wyam. Bring physical and spiritual comfort to Robert Roger Meisner and to Ronnie Meyer. Bring healing to Jolene Rogo, Hope Morrow, Brenda and Nathaniel Page, Irma Drosky, Lanny Traeger, Marilyn Ninke, Robert and Bonnie Buffington, Carolyn Carlisle, Judith Wessels, Linda Falcon, Catherine Shin, Tom Rogers, Lori and Phil Candle, Renee Davis, Carly Yarrington, Katie Vandeveer, Rodney and Marlene Johnson, Judy Page, Terry Brandenburg, Ralph and Lenora Elliott, Lynn Gable, the wife of former pastor of Teresa Schwartz, Elaine Hellcamp, and for all who are in hospitals and nursing homes and those who care for them and others we mention in our hearts. We thank you for giving another birthday to Benton Bell, Kylie Morton, Doug Picard, and Marilyn Schultz. 
we thank you for the gift of life and give to each of these eternal life in Christ. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. We prepare for receiving the Lord's Supper by uh, singing uh, the great thanksgiving, always and everywhere, praise and thanks are due to you, Lord, holy, holy, holy Lord, for your promises fulfilled in Jesus Christ, for sin forgiven, death defeated, life restored forevermore, the church on earth and the hosts of heaven join in worship. Because Jesus willingly entered Jerusalem and because of his sacrifice, we are not afraid to approach the Father in prayer and sing. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You may be seated.
Savior's name we go. In word and deed, God's love to show. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. The heavenly Father and the Son and Holy Spirit, three in one, the God who our salvation won. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Please be seated. Glad you're here today. Um, for today, there's only one class meeting, and that's the class on Luther's large catechism. My class on evangelism or sharing the faith will not meet this week. Uh, the adult instruction class is not meeting this week, nor the junior confirmation class either. And uh, then at 4 o'clock today, you may return here for a special voters meeting, which is an update on from our circuit visitor, Pastor Spomer, concerning the call process. And uh, we hope you can be present. That's four o'clock today. Uh, we are hoping that it can be live streamed. Uh, there's a possibility that uh, our videographer was exposed this last week. He had uh, a uh, test yesterday but hasn't heard the results quite yet. Hopefully he'll hear this afternoon, unless I can hear from one of the guys up there from Richard that you're able to run it this afternoon. Would you be available at 4 o'clock? You, you, you can do it? Okay, well, so it looks like we'll, uh, if for some reason you can't come, then it should be online, live at 4 o'clock as well. Um, then next Sunday, we have our regular quarterly voters meeting, 
and uh, that will be during the Sunday school hour. So again, certain classes will not meet. We probably will have the junior confirmation class meet and possibly the adult instruction course that is, will be uh, determined this week yet. Uh, but that's next week during the Sunday school hour. Also this Thursday at 11.30 in the morning, Prime Timers is going to meet for Bring Your Own Lunch in the Fellowship Hall and a movie, so we hope you can be part of that as well. That should be a good time for us. And I think I covered all the bases, unless somebody can think of something I forgot. And we're glad that you're here, and God's blessings on your week.